Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Is Wind Energy Right for Your Community? As promised, I'm gonna try to start right on time. My name is Sarah Mills and I am a researcher at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. So here's the plan for the next hour. First, I'll provide a brief overview of how utility scale wind development works, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Then I'll turn to my research, which is mostly based on surveys of landowners living in communities that have wind farms. I'll first talk about what they think about the individual level impacts of wind development, and then what they say about the community level impacts. I'll pull this all together to help you think through how to balance those pros and cons if you're considering whether or not turbines are right for your community. And finally, if I can keep myself on topic, we should have 10 to 15 minutes left for question and answers. To facilitate Q&A so that I can get to as many questions as possible, I'm going to ask that you submit your questions in writing. In the blue jeans console off to the right, you should see an icon with a person and a little chat bubble in it. And if you mouse over it, it says moderator chat. If you could please submit your questions there whenever they come to you. I have a couple colleagues in the office here with me that'll be collecting those and feeding them my way. If I can quickly address a question right then and there, I will, but I expect that most of the questions I'll answer at the end. Okay, so let's get started. First off, I think it'll help if you understand where I'm coming from and how my research is funded. So I am a native Michigander. I grew up on a farm in Monroe County, which is in the extreme southeastern corner of the state. When I came back to get my PhD, it wasn't to study wind energy. It was to study farmland preservation. I was really worried about all of the subdivisions that were being built on farmland around my hometown. My dissertation tested the claims being made by planners in two Michigan counties that wind development was a way to preserve farmland. I'll present some of those findings from you today. But in the process of doing that research, I became interested in understanding why some places with wind turbines seemed so gung-ho to uh, welcome additional turbines, but others effectively said enough is enough. Almost two years ago, I received a grant from the CS Mott Foundation out of Flint to both collect some more data to understand why people are satisfied or dissatisfied with the wind farms in their community, and then to communicate back with other communities that are deciding whether or not um, to welcome wind the findings from these, this research. Over the past six months, I've been to almost two dozen townships and counties across the state sharing this research thanks to that Mott Foundation grant. And today's webinar is to help ensure that this information can get in the hands of communities where I wasn't able to be in person. I want to be really clear that the goal of this research isn't to be pro-wind or anti-wind. It's to provide communities with data about the pros and cons as experienced by the people who live or own property in communities with wind farms. As you'll see, I don't just rely on the opinions of those who are motivated enough to show up to a meeting or get their story into a newspaper. I ask everyone in those townships to get a better sense of the underlying attitudes in these communities. Before I dive into the data, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page um, about what I mean when I say utility scale wind. Utility scale turbines these days are typically right around 500 feet tall, and they are about two megawatts a piece. Depending on where they're sited, that's enough to produce um, enough power each year for 500 to 800 homes. This map just shows those turbines that are in wind parks of at least 10 megawatts, so five to six turbines, depending on the size of the turbine. So it's going to miss out on the two turbines that you see up by the Mackinac Bridge, among others across the state. There's utility scale wind development currently operating in eight Michigan counties, and I've done surveys in five of these eight counties. If you aren't from Michigan or familiar with these places, you might not know what our landscapes look like. This isn't West Texas or Iowa. We do have a very vibrant agricultural community and agricultural industry, but there are lots of people that live in Michigan farming communities. So here are just a couple pictures of two of the state's wind farms. This is the Stony Corners wind farm up near Cadillac. And this is a picture from the thumb of Michigan, where most of the state's wind development is. 
All right, again, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm gonna give you the basics about how wind development works because not all wind developers in the state do this in the same way. Now, all of the processes pretty much start out the same way. The first thing that a wind developer will do is come into a community to figure out which landowners are willing to have a turbine sited on their property. The wind developer goes around trying to get as many landowners as possible to sign exploratory leases, which gives the landowner a pretty small amount of money per acre for a couple of years while the wind developer does more studying to figure out if the project is going to work. So once the wind developer signs up as many people as he can, he takes that information back to the engineers who look at local zoning, wind availability, and other constraints like endangered species and radio communications. There's a long list to determine where those turbines are going to go. In all cases, those landowners who end up having turbines sited on their property move from an exploratory lease to an active lease or easement, and they are usually paid on a per acre basis for the land that's taken out of production in order to site that turbine and the access road to get to it. They also usually get a royalty, which is a portion of the profits that are made by selling the wind energy that's generated by that turbine back to the electric grid. This is what I'll call the traditional business model. In the newer business model, which is also called a pooled royalties model, that royalty is shared on a per acre basis among everyone who signed one of those exploratory leases. So if farmer A has 80 acres in the wind farm and farmer B also has 80 acres, they will receive the same royalty payment. Now, if farmer A ended up with a turbine on his property, he will also get some sort of additional payment to compensate for the land that's being used. But he's not gonna get as much as in the old business model because you have more people that are effectively sharing that same pot of money. Some wind developers also do what's called a participation or friendly neighbor agreement. This is for landowners that don't have parcels big enough to feasibly place a turbine on. That's usually 20 acres or less. If these landowners were included in the royalty pool, they'd get very little because they just don't have very much land in comparison to everybody else. But these friendly neighbor agreements give them a fixed price. I've heard on the order of $1,000 per year for 20 years or whatever the length of the wind farm is supposed to be. And that um, is for free access to the wind that blows over their property. Now, regardless of the business model that the wind developer uses, everyone in the township would indirectly financially benefit from the wind farm because wind developers pay personal property taxes on the value of the wind turbine. There's a depreciation schedule for wind turbines that are set by the state, and so the value received by the jurisdiction diminishes over time. But in 2015, it amounted to about $20 million statewide, and that works out to about $22,000 per turbine per year. Again, this is an average, so it would be more in the first year and then go down over time. Um, and it also depends on the initial cost of the turbine and what your millage rate is. But this is just to give you some sense of scale. Okay, that's what I have on the basic background of how wind development works. Again, if you have questions, you can send them to me by using the moderator chat icon off to the right of your screen. And if I don't answer them now, I'll try to get to them in the Q&A. Now what I'd like to do is walk you through the data that I've collected through my research. Most of what I'm going to present is from what I call my community survey. This was sent out in the summer of 2016. It was mailed to all owners of land that, were, that was assessed for, for tax purposes as either agricultural or residential in 10 townships with wind farms. You'll see here that I have um, the Garden Township in Delta County in the UP, the Stony Corners project here near Cadillac that I showed you earlier, that straddles Misaki and Osceola counties, and then I sent the survey to seven townships in Huron County. I heard back from just over 2,000 of these landowners, which is 53% of all landowners. 
As I mentioned earlier, this is the survey that was funded by the Mott Foundation. And the survey itself is up on the website so you can see exactly how I asked the questions and what order I asked them in. A couple of the slides that I'll show you are from my 2014 farmland survey, which was sent only to owners of ag land in nine of those same townships that I went back to in 2016. You can see I didn't survey, uh, send a survey to the UP in 2014. So those nine townships with wind farms are in dark blue. And I also sent the survey to five townships where there hadn't been wind development at that time, and those are in light blue. Overall, there are fewer landowners who just own ag land. So this is the first survey. So on this first survey, I only heard back from about 1,200 respondents. But that's 72% of all owners of ag land in these 14 townships. I'm going to pause here because most people don't believe I'm telling the truth on that response rate. My trick is that I sent a survey to farmers in February. I included a $2 bill and I told them that I was a student. Um, which I was at that time. Uh, so this survey too is up on the website. And I also want to note that it was funded by a Dow Sustainability Fellowship, which is a U of M grant for PhD students. Throughout these surveys, I found some common drivers of attitudes. One is whether or not the landowner is directly compensated. And this is just what everybody assumes, that wind development is a haves versus have nots issue. In the rest of my slides, I'll show you breakdowns based on whether or not the respondent was directly compensated. And you'll see that it does make a difference, but it doesn't tell the full story. What I found though, is that some payment is better than no payment. And there is a law of diminishing returns. Once you make over $1,000 a year, your attitudes don't change all that much. Another driver of attitudes is what type of land the person owns. Specifically, if they own a secondary home or a vacation home, they are more critical about wind energy than someone who owns a primary residence in the township. Why? Well, most of those with vacation homes bought that home to get out of the city, enjoy the peace and quiet and see the stars at night. And wind turbines can interfere with that. Those that have a primary residence and actively farm the land, or those that just own farmland in the community and live somewhere else, tend to be the most positive about wind energy. This is true even after you account for whether or not they are directly compensated. The reasoning for this, I think, is that most of these people who own farmland tend to be from that community and didn't move there for the scenery. They live there because they have family ties there, and as a result, they tend to be willing to put up with some of the more not so pleasant things that support active farming, bad smells, loud noises, that kind of thing. I often tell people that my mom grew up on a hog farm. It's not that she and her family loved the smell of pig manure, but they and their neighbors put up with it because that's how they were making their living. Another common driver of attitudes is being within earshot of the turbines, and that's pretty predictable. And then the final important factor is how the wind developer or how the landowner felt about the planning process that led up to siting the turbines and how they felt about the wind developer. If they thought that they were given lots of opportunity to have a say during the planning stage, or if they felt that the wind developer acted openly and transparently, they were much more likely to support the existing wind project and say they'd be willing to have more turbines in their community in the future. I'll have more slides on this at the very end of the presentation. I have just a couple questions that came in about um, the background and the survey, so I'm gonna answer them really quickly. One was, how much is the depreciation over the life of the wind turbine? The tax table that's set up right now has it taxed at 30% by um, year 10 and going forward outside of that. So it starts out in year one, you can tax 100% of the value, by year 10, it goes down to 30%, and then it stays at 30% of the initial value for the rest of the life. Um, the second one was the response statistically valid. Um, because I don't have a, um, because I didn't sample, I sent it as a census to everyone, I don't have to worry about sampling error, that I somehow only selected people that were pro-wind or anti-wind. Um, 
in terms of uh, the responses, I was able to look and see if I had heard more from people who receive compensation versus not. Um, in that first survey, when I sent the survey out to those who are living in the communities with wind turbines versus not, there was an almost identical response rate. And so I don't have any reason to believe that my results are skewed one way or the other, but it is possible that some people um, were just not motivated to return the survey. So um, thanks for the questions and you can feel free to send them along. Okay, so at long last, I'm gonna get to my data. Um, what do people actually have to say about how the turbines are affecting them? So let's start with noise. I'm gonna walk you through this first graph and then you'll be able to understand all the rest. So here across the top of the graph, you can see the statement that I posed on the survey, wind turbines create noise pollution. In the dark blue here are those uh, respondents that strongly agree. In the blue, lighter blue, it's just those who agree. And then you can go down in the dark orange here, it's strongly disagree. Now over here in this left column, oops, Sorry, I advanced it too fast. Over in the left column um, are all of the respondents to that 2016 survey. So this is the owners of residential or ag land in those 10 townships with wind turbines. And here you can see that 48% say that they agree that turbines are noisy and 52% disagree that turbines are noisy. So it's pretty much split 50-50. Over to the right of the blue line is that same data but that's separated based on whether the respondent was paid or unpaid. And here you can see that it's not entirely a haves versus have nots issue. Among those that are paid, 34% say they agree in blue that the turbines are noisy. Among those that are unpaid, 48% say they disagree that turbines are noisy. So again, it's not entirely black and white. On the visual impacts, we see really similar results. It's roughly split 50-50 between those who agree turbines are ugly and those who disagree that they are ugly. Those that are unpaid are more likely to say they're ugly, but not overwhelmingly so. Now, something that I often hear is that it's not so much the sight of the turbines during the day, but the blinking red light that the FAA requires on the top of the turbines at night that really alters the view. White or gray turbines can blend into the landscape during the day, but there's no chance of that blinking red light blending in in the nighttime. I am not a person who tends to think that technology can solve all of our problems, but if the blinking red light is the sticking point for your community, there is a technological solution. The FAA recently approved a radar device that keeps the lights off until an airplane gets in the vicinity of the wind farm and then it turns the lights on. This hasn't been used in Michigan yet, but I understand that it has been used in a couple projects elsewhere. And my guess is that it isn't cheap, and so it may decrease landowner payments. But if that's the sticking point, again, there is a technology that'll solve it. But at any rate, it's right around half the people that are bothered by the sight of turbines. Okay, far fewer people in townships with wind farms, wind turbines, believe that those turbines cause human health problems. About 27% agree turbines cause human health problems and 72% say they don't cause human health problems. I meant to mention earlier that I left all of the decimal places off, so you'll occasionally see columns that add to 99 like this one does or 101. I'm sorry if that's throwing anybody off. Okay, uh, back to health impacts. If you Google wind turbine syndrome, you will come up with a bunch of information on health impacts, but the medical research community has largely found it to be unfounded. Now, I am not a medical doctor, but from the peer-reviewed literature that I've read, there is no direct causal link between wind turbines and human health impacts. There is some research right now on stress and annoyance related to turbines. The thinking is that some people who have a wind turbine in their community didn't want it there in the first place. If that turbine is making noise or catching their eye, that can stress them out and that can lead to physiological symptoms, which makes sense to me, but that's an indirect link. Also from my research, it seems that there may well be ways to make that turbine less annoying or less stressful to people by involving people in the planning process or paying more people to have it in their community. It's not a technological solution, but something that you can do to potentially reduce 
um, these indirect human um, health impacts. But again, most people living in Michigan communities with wind turbines say they do not cause human health impacts. Another impact that people talk about is the impact the project will have on property values. Now, I sit on the planning commission in the city of Ann Arbor, and I can tell you that this is a concern that people bring up pretty much with any development pr proposal, not just wind turbines. In communities with wind turbines, 54% of landowners believe that the turbines have decreased nearby property values, while 46% say property values haven't been affected. One thing to note here is that this is perception. To my knowledge, there haven't been any studies done in these particular Michigan communities to see if property values really did drop. And it's really hard because properties just don't change hands all that often in these rural communities. But it is perception that matters and that's what my survey asks about. There are tons of property value studies done elsewhere. Some find that property values decrease, some find no change. The best type of study is called a meta-analysis, and meta-analyses look across all of these studies to try to account for oddball factors. Uh, the meta-analyses uh, done on wind turbines have done, been done by researchers at the national laboratories, and they find that there is no solid evidence that, de that turbines decrease property values. One final thing to note is that all of these previous studies have been on residential property, not on farmland. And on the next slide, I'll show you there may be some evidence that wind development may be increasing farmland values. Okay, so here you can see I've shifted the orientation of the graph to remember to tell you that this slide is using data from my 2014 survey. This was just owners of farmland, and it also went out to some farmers in communities without wind turbines. On the survey, I asked landowners about the amount of money that they'd invested in their property in the last five years, and that's broken down into a few different categories. Above the blue line here are the landowners in communities without wind farms. And you can see that on average, they invested $187,000 in that five-year period in their home, outbuildings, drainage and irrigation, and equipment. Below the blue line, these are different groups of landowners within the wind farm communities. So first are those unpaid neighbors, the people who own farmland in the wind farm community but who don't get a check in the mail. Their investment is statistically the same as the non-wind farm group. Next are those who are paid but don't have a turbine on their property. So these are the people in that new business model, that pooling royalties model. Again, their investment is not different than the other two groups, st statistically speaking. But down here on the bottom are those who have a turbine on their property. They invested two and a half times as much on average as the other groups. Now, what this graph leaves off is that these landowners with turbines on their property tend to own more land than the other groups. And so you would expect them to be investing more in their farm than the other groups. But even after you account for that, when you take into consideration both how much land they own and how much land they farm, they invest twice as much as the other groups. So getting back to what I was saying on the previous slide about property values, if they are improving their outbuildings or tiling their fields, that's going to increase that value of their ag property. The final individual level impact is on farm succession planning. Within the farmland preservation literature, it says that, farm, uh, that farmers with a succession plan in place are more likely to pass that farm down to the next generation rather than just sell it off to an old farmer um, to make bigger land holdings and ultimately fewer people living in the community. Much like the previous slide, the only statistically significant difference here is between landowners with turbines on their property and everyone else. In my interviews, farmers have told me that the guaranteed income coming from the turbines helps their kids think that farming isn't such a risky business, and so they're more willing to be more willing to take over the farm. The oldest wind farms in Michigan, though, aren't even 10 years old yet, and so it's too soon to tell whether these young people will actually stay on the farm. But having a succession plan in place is a really good sign that they will. Okay, to summarize again, attitudes are really split 50-50 on impacts related to noise, visual impacts, and property value reductions. 
you can say that those who are directly compensated have a rosier view, or you could say that those who have no financial stake have a more soured view. But even among these groups, um, attitudes vary. And so this isn't totally a haves versus have nots issue. Most also don't see human health impacts, but some do. And if in zoning you are regulating for the public health, safety, and general welfare, that's something that you should be aware of. Finally, there is strong evidence that direct payments are helping landowners reinvest in their farms and develop succession plans. Both of those things are really good signs that the farmer isn't planning on selling their land anytime soon. And so it's a really good thing for farmland preservation. Wind farms, though, don't just have impacts on individual landowners. They can have impacts on whole communities. In this next section, I'll step through some of those impacts. So the first is on jobs. On my survey, a large majority of respondents agreed that wind turbines create jobs, but I'm gonna give this slide a caveat. You see, I send people a paper survey, and so they can, and they do, write me notes in the margins. And on this question, I had more marginal notes than on any other question. People often wrote to me, but not local jobs. There are tons of people that are employed in, the, in wind development, especially in the construction trades. But mo most of these construction crews are brought in from elsewhere. The local jobs that are created during construction tend to be in the hospitality industry, housing and feeding out of town workers. But there are also some construction jobs locally, hauling aggregate or concrete. They're not going to bring those things in from long distances. But there just aren't tons of long-term, high-paying wind, wind energy technician jobs that you hear so much about. And in some of the places, um, the community colleges just don't yet have training programs for that trade. So locals aren't qualified for those types of jobs anyway. So again, people do say turbines create jobs, but I'm going to give this a caveat. The next community level impact is on the roads. Now here you can see that I added a gray neutral category right here. Um, in blue, we have people who say that roads have improved as a result of turbines. Down in the orange shades, you can see roads have worsened and in gray that they've neither improved nor worsened. So here, a majority, 60%, say that there hasn't been a change in roads. 12% say that roads have worsened, and this is because there is lots of heavy equipment going down these country roads. And there's also an increase in traffic during construction. On the other hand, you say, have 27% saying that roads have improved. This is because most counties have some provisions um, that about preparing the roads for heavy equipment, and then repairing any damage that may have been caused after that heavy equipment goes down the roads. So you would at least have some hope that roads aren't, haven't worsened over time. But if you recall from one of my earliest slides, wind developers are paying local property taxes to county and township governments. And in these rural areas, one of the biggest budget lines is road maintenance. So People who are seeing roads improve are largely saying this because wind tax revenues are being put towards roads. I also asked a separate question about what impact wind development has had on township services. Here you can see again that a large majority say township services neither improved nor worsened. Very few people said that services improved, but only 22%, or I'm sorry, very few people said that services worsened. 5% down here in orange, but only 22% say that they improved. This is really surprising to me, given that in Huron County alone in one year, township governments received $2.6 million just from the personal property taxes wind developers paid. In the townships that I've studied, this has meant an increase in their overall property tax revenues anywhere from 11% to 400%. And even in this township where the budget quintupled, less than a third of residents said that services had improved. Now, I know from interviewing the township supervisor that those tax revenues are being used. The township is paving an extra half mile of road. It's really expensive to pave roads. Um, or they're graveling three or four extra miles of road a year. 
but it's hard for residents to know what would have happened if the wind project hadn't been built. They don't realize that so many other local governments across the state are having to cut services or raise tax rates since costs are increasing faster than local government revenues. Just one township in my study had introduced a new service, trash collection. And that service didn't take all that much of the wind farm tax revenue to do this, but it was a much more visible impact to the residents. In that township, 60% of residents said that township services had improved. Again, at the county level, most people say that county services haven't changed. And again, it's not because there isn't a lot of money being paid to county government. In Huron County, again, the county took in almost $3 million in 2015, but they put that money towards funding their retiree health care obligation. So residents weren't wrong that county services hadn't improved, but their county was in a much better financial position. And if you talk to county officials, they say it was really making a difference. We see the same pattern here on school funding. Compared to townships and counties, the public perception is that there's more of a positive impact on schools. Though again, over half of respondents say schools haven't worsened or improved. This is particularly interesting given the way property taxes to schools work in Michigan, particularly for the local district. I'm not an expert on this myself, but I have a colleague at U of M who has done interviews with ISD and local school officials as part of this Mott Foundation grant. Because local district funding is based on a per pupil allowance, there's very little impact on the local district budget. ISDs do get to keep their tax revenues, but their budgets are much bigger. And so my colleagues' interviews with ISD officials have pretty much shown that there isn't a huge impact on the ISD either. They, ISD officials will say every little bit helps and it prevents them from having to cut programs, but most haven't substantially increased services. She has a write-up on this research on the close-up win page that I'll point you to at the end of the webinar. Again, though, just to put this in context, in Huron County, more than $4 million was paid to school taxes in 2015. Okay, this slide gets us out of tax land and into something a little bit different from the other impacts. Here I asked about the impact that the WIND project had on their relationships with neighbors. Anecdotally, there's often concerns in communities that the WIND project will turn neighbors into enemies. And coming from a rural community myself, I know that this is a big deal. In a rural community, you know all of your neighbors and you do care what they think about you. Overall, I'm not seeing that wind development is ripping communities apart. 64% of landowners in communities with wind farms say their relationships with neighbors neither improved nor worsened. There are more who believe that their relationships worsened rather than improved, but even then, it's less than a third of respondents who say that. Again, in summary, at the community level, I'm finding that most do see job creation benefits, but with that caveat about the types of local jobs that are created. I'm finding that the majority haven't seen changes to community services or to local schools, and I think this is for a number of reasons. One is that I think people don't realize how property tax revenue is spent or how much things cost their local government. Another is that they can't comprehend what would have happened in the absence of tax revenue. And finally, I think that there are a couple of quirks to Michigan's tax system that may be to blame, but I'm not gonna go into that right here. Finally, I found that the majority of residents in these wind farm communities do not believe that the turbine has divided their community. And that's even in some very contentious wind farms. If you throw out the wind farm in the UP, which I included in my survey because it was so contentious, the percentage that believes that the wind farm has divided their community drops almost in half. Okay, so I've presented what residents in wind farm townships think about the individual and community impacts of wind development, but what is their overall assessment of wind energy? I have two ways of measuring this. The first is by looking at what impact they feel the project has had on their overall quality of life in the township. And here, you can see that this graph looks an awful lot like the last one I showed you about relationships with neighbors. 
over half say that their quality of life hasn't changed. More do say quality of life has worsened than improved, but not by a huge margin. It's 29% to, to 16%. And nearly all of those who say that quality of life has worsened also said that relationships with neighbors had worsened. Another way to measure their overall assessment is to ask them whether they'd accept more wind turbines in their township. Overall, there is slightly more support than opposition for more wind development. Here you can see 42% compared to 36%, though feelings are stronger among those who are opposed. What I found particularly interesting is looking at those who are unpaid. You can see that overall, they're less supportive of additional wind development than those who are paid, but 38% of those who are unpaid say they would support a wish additional wind development, and only 40% would oppose it, so it's pretty evenly split among this group. This is definitely not the impression that you get when you go to most planning commission meetings or township board meetings in Michigan where wind energy is being discussed. Okay, so what should you do? As I've just shown you, there are both pros and cons of wind development. How do you balance them? As a planner, I'm going to advocate, advocate for thinking about how wind development fits with your long-term plan. And the first thing I'm going to assert is that for most rural communities in Michigan, wind energy is primarily an economic development proposition. But I'm also going to assert that this sort of economic development might not be compatible with some other community goals. If the goal in your community is for substantial residential development or substantial growth in tourism, wind development might not be right for your community. The reason being is that these landowners are less likely to directly benefit from the project because they don't own larger parcels of land and some may be, deterred, may be deterred from building a brand new vacation home or building a home or, uh, or buying a home in a new subdivision in the midst of a wind farm. Now, on the other hand, if your community's goal is to go all in on agriculture, my research finds that wind development could be a really good fit. By giving farmers another way to make money off their land, it allows them to diversify their income and shore up their succession plans. This may help stabilize the, stabilize the population if these young people choose to stay on the farm rather than move away. And it not only financially helps the farmer, but also helps the community in terms of property tax revenues. I am concerned about taking good farmland out of production. But if you site turbine access roads or the turbine themselves on fence rows, it's possible to take absolutely no land out of production. And because of the relatively small footprint of a wind turbine, the state's PA 116 farmland preservation program has ruled that you don't have to disenroll your land from that program if you put a turbine on it. Now, once you determine if wind energy fits with your community goals or not, then you should set your zoning to match your goal. Just as I'm not a medical doctor, I am also not a lawyer, um, but I have seen that it is possible to create a legally defensible zoning ordinance that either minimizes or maximizes opportunities for turbines to be placed in the community. It does this through a combination of setback distances, noise limits, and other requirements. Once you've decided that you know you want turbines, or you know that you don't want them in your community, I suggest that you adopt a zoning ordinance that sends the message either that you are open for business or that you are not interested. This will save your jurisdiction and the wind developer a whole lot of time and money. Wind developers aren't looking for, are, or sorry, wind developers are looking for communities that want them there. And Gratiot County is a really good example of that. Gratiot County doesn't have the best wind resources in the state, but they clearly articulated that wind energy is compatible with their agricultural development plans, and they have a zoning ordinance that makes it possible for a wind developer to site a project there. On the other extreme, you have some townships in the windiest part of the state that haven't outright banned wind development, but their zoning ordinance makes it so difficult to site a project 
that wind developers haven't even bothered talking to landowners in these townships. They know it's just not possible to site a project there. So is there a magical setback distance or noise limit that's going to make everyone in your township happy? As a planner, I really wish I could tell you that there was, but I don't have that. I don't see that evidence of that from my research. What I've done here is taken the data I presented a couple slides back on support and opposition for additional wind development in the township and broken the responses down by the setback distance in the zoning ordinance. That's one of the more contentious issues. It's contentious because if that setback distance is too large, you won't be able to find enough land area in the township to site turbines. But if the setback distance is too small, turbines can be much closer to homes. So you'd expect that as you increase the setback distance, people would be more willing to welcome additional turbines because their homes are better buffered. That's not at all what I'm seeing. There's one community here on the left um, that I studied where there's absolutely no zoning ordinance. Wind development is a private agreement between the wind developer and the property owner. And more than half of the residents there want more wind development. That's surprising since there's nothing protecting them from a neighbor putting a wind turbine right on the property line. By contrast, in the township off to the right, with the largest setback distance, where homeowners are more protected, only 30% support additional wind development. So I have no evidence that there is a magical setback distance that will put all concerned citizens' fears to rest, but will allow farmers who want turbines on their property to still have those turbines. What I have pulled together are a couple of resources you might consider. So the Michigan State University Extension has a couple of guidance documents. This first one from 2017 provides more of a framework for elements that you could consider in your zoning ordinance. And I really like this second resource from 20, 2007. I feel like it does a really good job um, talking about the pros and cons and how you might balance those in your zoning ordinance. The Department of Energy has a database of ordinances on wind that are available online, but be sure that you check for similar types of communities to yours. Many in this database are relatively suburban. And you should also note that this includes ordinances for places both with and without turbines. And you should look for those that, with goals that match your community. Shiawassee County right now is in the process of writing an ordinance regarding wind energy. And I think it's done a really good job of pulling together comparison charts on each of the key topics. Again, their work includes both communities where the ordinance is welcoming to wind and where the ordinance all but prohibits wind. So you should keep that in mind. And finally, I've included a link to my website um, where I've collected ordinances for the communities in the state that currently have projects, since I already had them together for my research. I want to reiterate just one more time that when you are pulling the data together, you should go back to your goal. If you want turbines in your township, then in your comparison chart, you should be looking at the ordinances for communities with turbines. If you don't want turbines in your township, then you should be looking at the ordinances for communities that don't have turbines. Okay, so my research does suggest that there are a couple of things that you might consider in your zoning. First, I think it's very wise to differentiate between participating and non-participating landowners in considering setback distances or noise limits. And I think that for the following reason. When you do, it forces wind developers to work harder to get more people signed up. And my research suggests that when you have more people signed up as participating landowners, not only are those people happier, but it changes the community conversation about wind energy. Rather than talking about those couple of greedy farmers who brought this wind farm upon the community, instead people are talking about those couple of people who wished they'd signed leases. And generally, in communities where more people are participating, people are much less likely to talk to me or to tell me that the project caused community tension. So I think it's worthwhile to distinguish between participating and non-participating landowners. 
I also think it makes sense to ask the wind developer to model noise and flicker for everyone in the township who is concerned about what impact the project will have on them. The reasoning is that wind developers do this anyway, but I think that so much of the tension in communities arises out of the fear of the unknown impacts. And these models may help to reduce some of that fear. It's also really important to have a public discussion about decommissioning and for the local government to explain in layman's terms what sort of financial guarantee they have that they will be able to take down the turbines if the wind developer goes belly up. In most of the places where I've studied, they do have decommissioning plans and fairly sizable bonds to cover costs. But most residents either don't know about it or they don't trust that they will actually be funds available 20 years from now. And so I think it's really important that local government talks about this. And finally, it's really important to have an open and transparent process as you're developing your ordinances relating to wind development and to provide as many opportunities as you can for township residents to ask questions and give feedback. This graph is showing that. Um, this graph is again looking at whether people would support or oppose additional wind development in their township. But it's broken down here based on the extent to which the person agreed or disagreed that they had an ample opportunity to provide input during the wind project planning stage. So among those who strongly agreed that they were given this opportunity, 74% said that they would support additional wind development. By contrast, among those who strongly disagreed that they had an ample opportunity to provide input, 73% say they would oppose additional wind development. So what happens the first time around really matters in terms of how people feel about the existing project and whether or not they're welcoming to additional wind development. The same is true when it comes to wind developer actions. So among those who strongly agreed that the wind developer acted openly and transparently the first time around, 77% said they would support additional wind development. Among those who strongly disagreed that the wind developer acted openly and transparently, 83% say they would oppose future wind development. This shouldn't be surprising, but it's really important to keep in mind. To facilitate that transparency, if you have a wind developer approach your community, don't be afraid to ask them questions. Ask about who benefits and what their business model is. Are they pooling royalties or are they just paying those with turbines on their property? You can ask them about the amount of tax revenue that they anticipate paying to the local government and how that compares to the existing tax base. You can ask them about the impacts that the project would have on specific homes, on your home. You can ask them about their typical siting scheme. Do they site turbines on property lines or in the middle of fields? And you can ask them how they plan to handle decommissioning. What agreements do they have with landowners and with the local government? How can they assure you that there will be enough money to cover their costs? That sort of thing. Okay, so if you can't tell, I could absolutely talk for days about wind energy in Michigan, but I've come to the end of my slides and I want to make sure that I turn to this list of questions that my colleagues have been keeping track of for me. Let me take a drink and then I'll turn right to those. The first question is, have you considered the distance from a turbine in the sound issue or the setbacks used? That is something that I haven't considered. And the reason being is that many landowners own parcels in different parts of the township. And so it's really difficult to measure that distance. Um, are we measuring it from their house? Are we measuring it from um, if their house is in another jurisdiction? How does that factor in? So I haven't done that. A lot of the studies um, that have been published, though, do look at distance and how that impacts attitudes towards wind energy. And if you're interested in some of those studies, if you drop me an email or give me a phone call, I'm happy to point you towards them. The next question, are these responses only based on opinions or measured facts? Um, and this is certainly opinions. It's an opinion survey. Um, so as I noted when I was talking about um, property value depreciation, these are opinions. I did not specifically say, do you have evidence that your property values have decreased? 
Um, let's see, the next question. Um, before the end of the presentation, can you let us know if the research is yet published and where we might obtain copies of the articles? So um, on the website, and I'll say this again before we close, I do have a number of um, reports that are really intended for the public. So these are not peer reviewed, although the data behind them is either already peer reviewed or currently undergoing peer review. Um, so those are kind of publicly focused reports that you can get. I do have a a chapter out that is looking at the um, investment and uh, the farmland investment and the succession planning that if you drop me an email, I would be happy to send you a link to. Okay. Um, what did you find on the impacts on birds and wildlife? Um, that is a good question. I did ask about birds and wildlife on my survey, but I didn't include it just to try to keep this within an hour. Um, Generally speaking, more than half of the people living in wind farm communities do not believe that turbines have an impact on wildlife. Um, but I know in some communities, and birds in particular, but I know in some communities that is of concern. Honestly, um, that is one of the lesser concerns, at least in the places that I've studied. Have there been any change in the utility cost, the electric bill for people in the township? So no. Um, their electric bill, they, in most of these places or in Michigan generally, people are generally served by either consumers power or D DTE. Um, whether you live in a community with a wind farm or not, you pay the same electric rate that everybody else in that service territory pays. And so they have not seen changes to their electric bill as a result of the turbine that other people in other places haven't. Um, Let's see, is there a move toward community-based or community-led wind projects in Michigan? So that's a good question. Um, it, I should first explain what a community-based or community-led wind project is, and that's where um, it, often it's owned by the community. So uh, members in the community will pitch in to help fund um, to provide the initial investment for them. Um, most of the wind projects in the state, again, I'm looking at utility scale projects. So these are five, six turbines minimum. In fact, it, the smallest uh, utility scale project I, in the state is, I think, 18. Um, that's a lot of capital for very, for these very um, small communities to pull together. So to date, there's not tons of that going on. I think that there are some people that are interested in figuring out how communities can better um, get ahead of wind developers and so say, hey, we want wind development here, but we want it on our terms. We're gonna lay that information out to the wind developer and wind developers, you come here if you can meet our terms. Um, if that's something you wanna talk about, again, email me or call me, I'll be in back in my office uh, in 15 minutes, as soon as we're done here. Um, let's see, what time commitment and community hearing should be scheduled in developing a wind ordinance? Months? Yes, months. And the reason that I say this is that it's really, really important to give people lots of opportunity to give feedback. Um, whether or not you have staff, I mean, most of the rural communities in the state um, don't have a planner on their staff. They may not have any paid staff members within their township government. Um, and so they're relying on an outside consultant or on the planning commissioners themselves to do all of the research behind this. Um, it's, a, it's a big decision to be made in communities. And so um, it's gonna take time both to pull together the information, but then to make sure that you have ample, give people ample opportunity to provide feedback. Um, the next question, I've heard that there is wind tourism, people coming to visit turbines, but your presentation says wind energy and tourism aren't compatible, why? So um, that's a really good question too. Uh, most of the tourism in the state, um, so let me back up. There could certainly be tourism that is driven by wind turbines. In fact, in Huron County, um, when we look at impacts on the roads, I have had a couple 
people write on their survey that it's the tour buses coming to see these turbines that are increasing traffic on their roads. Um, so there's definitely some element of wind related tourism. But in Michigan, that's not generally why people are, um, what's bringing tourists to some of these communities. You know, along the Great Lakes, it's certainly uh, certainly associated with the lakes themselves, but we have lots of in um, interior lakes too. Um, and so, yes, it could drive, um, wind development could drive tourism. I haven't seen tons of research on that. And I'm hedging my bets that, um, that I, it, I guess this is more the precautionary principle that it may interfere with the people who are coming to your community for seeing, you know, the stars um, and enjoying a quiet lakefront uh, or cabin um, getaway. All right, let's see. I'm trying to think if I've gotten through. Um, Sounds to me like a key part of your message is that wind developers should be paying off the neighbors. Is that ethical? Um, so I think that this is referring to the idea that uh, these these pooled arrangements or these friendly neighbor or participation agreements are giving um, our, our hush money effectively for the neighbors. And that's certainly one view. In Michigan, there is a really reasonable um, reasonable reason, that's a silly way to say it. Um, there's a logical reason for having these participation agreements, and that is that many of our ordinances that are on the books do distinguish between participating and non-participating landowners. And so it just gives the wind developer more flexibility um, if, they, if they have a way to um, have agreements with more neighbors in the community. But there's also another reason that these participating uh, participation agreements make sense, and that is that you can't line turbines up cheek to jowl. Um, the wind needs time to recuperate after it goes from one to the next. So you really do need free access to the wind that blows over the properties between turbines. And in my mind, the old model that only pays people with turbines on their property doesn't um, consider the economic benefit that is um, that is provided by that property owner in between turbines, um, that landowner's property really is providing a benefit to the project. Those turbines are able to operate appropriately, um, and so uh, it's. I think it is ethical, and there is a is, is a logical business case for why you might do that. Okay, I think we are almost out of time um, and there's still a couple questions left. So again, here's my contact information um, that you can get a hold of me if I didn't get to your question or if there's anything else you'd like to follow up on. Um, I also wanna point out as I did just a minute ago that on the webpage, you'll see both the blank survey instrument as well as some short reports. Um, with a with a summary of the data from the surveys and in that you um, it will include the impacts on birds. Um, I'll send you an email either later today or sometime tomorrow with a link to the webinar in case you'd like to share it with neighbors, friends, colleagues. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you again so much for joining me. Um, and I'd like to thank the Mott Foundation for funding both this research and this webinar. So thanks again and have a great day.